Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, podcasting from Mala Dumim in Israel. In times such as these in which we are living, the challenges are many. It is not merely the physical challenges that we must face, though those tend to get the bulk of our attention. There, are, there is no shortage of spiritual challenges also. These may take the form of challenges of faith or hope, but they may also take the form of moral challenges, such as the classic, should I help out this other person when, have, when I have my own pressing needs? It is not surprising that the needs of others take a backseat to our own needs at times when many are needy. This is simply the way things are and perhaps the way things have to be. But this kind of forced and justified selfishness comes with its own price. When all is said and done, we still have to look ourselves in the mirror. This week's Parsha is called Re'e, a short and innocent enough looking word, at least in Hebrew. It means look or see, an innocent enough sounding translation. It introduces a paragraph that states that God has presented the Israelites with two choices, a blessing and a curse, and that their lives will be determined by which course they choose. This is a very Deuteronomy-oriented theme that comes up a few times in this book. In this case, the opening word of the Parsha, that word re'e, comes in to focus their attention on the gravity of this choice. Look at those two paths that lie in front of you and make sure you choose correctly. This Parsha is the transition between the first section of Deuteronomy dealing with a historical recap of, a, of the past 40 years and the spiritual situation of the Israelites as they are on the cusp of entering the Holy Land. The second part, that dealing with a long series of specific commandments, begins with the third paragraph of this Parsha. These commandments uh, are various rules uh, about dealing with idolatry, a major theme of Deuteronomy, and the laws of kosher animals, and the various holidays. Within all that are smatterings, smatterings of other types of laws that have nothing whatsoever to do with these three major themes. It strikes the uninitiated as a bit haphazard. Among the, those minor themes of the Parsha is one dealing with an odd kind of agricultural arrangement known as the Shemitah year. This is the seventh year of a repeating seven-year cycle during which the land had to lie fallow and not be actively farmed. The main section dealing with this system come toward, comes towards the end of the book of Leviticus. Our section deals with a seemingly unrelated detail of that seventh year, which is known as the remission of debts. Technically, the word Shemitah, which is well known to observant Jews, refers to the remission of debts and not to anything agriculturally related. However, since both systems kick in during the seventh year, it is called the Shemitah year. And the word Shemitah has be also become linked to the rules about keeping the land foul. While the Shemitah year still applies to one degree or another to produce grown in the land of Israel, it never applied to anywhere outside of Israel. The remission of debts, however, always applied to Jews wherever they lived. It is one of those laws that became severed from its link to the land of Israel, like keeping kosher or observing the Shabbat. As far as we know, Jews have steadily observed this law in one way or another since biblical times. What this means in practicality is that any private debt must be released when the Shemitah year ends. As crazy as this sounds, it is biblical law. It happens that around 2,000 years ago, the famous Hillel, the forerunner of the early rabbinic leaders of the Jews, formulated a system to circumvent this rule. The for this formulation essentially was a way to transform private debts into public debts and thus not be subject to the Shemitah release. While some consider Hillel's formulation to be a loophole around an explicit biblical law, it has managed to become a firm part of Judaism. And so in reality, debts are no longer forgiven at any time in the Shemitah year. But we are going to focus on the law as, as it is stated in Deuteronomy and not as Hillel's formulation altered it. In the Bible, it is a straightforward release of debts with no ifs, ands, or buts. There is a classic biblical blessing for those who faithfully observe this law with the promise of financial security and national prominence. Nevertheless, the text writes that the poor will always be a part of the Israelite society. Consequently, there is a commandment of lending money to those in need and not to be stingy to those less fortunate than oneself. This is where the Shemitah concept comes in. Those loans, if they happen to extend beyond the expiration time of the Shemitah year, must be forgiven. 
The Torah even puts in a statement of caution with regard to this obviously problematic law. Quote, be careful, lest there be in your mind an irresponsible idea, knowing that the seventh year, which is the Shemitah year, is approaching, and you look unkindly upon your poor brother and do not give him anything. And he calls out to God, and it will be considered a sin on your part. Give to him, and do not let the giving seem wrong in your mind. For it is because of this that Hashem your God will bless you in all your doings that you are engaged. So it seems that the Torah foresaw the problem that Hilla will try to solve with his formulation. Rather than resorting to such a loophole, the Torah simply states that the very thought of not lending money to the poor person because of the approaching Shemitah year is wrong in and of itself. Even though there is a very real fear that the debt will be legally canceled and you won't get paid back, the law still applies. This is indeed somewhat puzzling. How could it be that the Torah would command such a thing? It is one thing to expect and demand of people to lend money when there is a reasonable expectation of getting paid back. But it is quite another to expect or demand those loans when there is a reasonable expectation to not get paid back. How could such, such a system ever have been instituted? How did it ever work? Even before Hillel came around and rectified things, it would seem that nobody would fall for such a risky proposition. Why then does the Torah refer to those who inter entertain thoughts along these lines as irresponsible. The actual Hebrew word for irresponsible is beli ya'al, a somewhat confusing looking word that is probably composed of two smaller words. Those words are beli, which means without, and ya'al, which means either yoke, as in yoke of responsibility, or something along the lines of goodness. Either way, it essentially means that the person lacks something in terms of basic morality. That is the Torah's description of one who doesn't feel like taking this highly risky move of lending money with the Shemitah you're approaching. But isn't this just basic common sense and not the least bit connected to morality? Perhaps there is a method to this madness. First of all, it should be noted that just because the Shemitah year mandated the release of private debts, it didn't say that the debts couldn't be paid back. The borrower, out of the goodness of his or her heart, and out of gratitude at the kindness that was extended by the lender, always has the option of paying back that debt, regardless of the laws of the Shemitah year. Granted, there is still a very real chance that the debt won't get paid back, but it's not quite the same as simply throwing away one's hard-earned money. However, that very real possibility that the debt will never get paid back has to be dealt with. Let's look at things from the perspective of God. There are people in the world, some fortunate and some less fortunate. All of them, however, are alive, and they owe their lives in one way or another to God. Those who don't need loans or even have the means of lending some of their money to others also owe a, a bit of that fortune to God, to one degree or another. What was it that put them in that situation to begin with? We may believe that it was our own brains, our own wise move that put that nest egg in the bank but at least some of it was due to things beyond our control. We tend to disregard this at this end of things and focus on those wise moves that we made. But what about that unquantifiable percentage of our success that was due to things that we really had nothing to do with? This, in the view of the Torah, is really the hidden hand of God. This rule is essentially demanding that we pay attention to that other source of our fortune and to recognize that it wasn't all our own doing. Others who may not have had such fortune are in need. Who is to supply them with this need? In days before welfare systems and security networks, it was only to their neighbors that they could turn. This commandment and its accompanying warning is really saying that we should be able to look beyond our own needs and precautions and to look to the unfulfilled needs of, those, of others less fortunate than us. It is irresponsible to even consider the possibility that the loan won't get repaid because of the oncoming Shemitah year. That rule is there so that we recognize that a good deal of our own fortune is not really ours to begin with. It, if it doesn't get paid back, it is because we were really were only guardians for that money and not true owners. To believe that it is entirely our own just because we happen to have been particularly fortunate is nothing less than irresponsible. 
While all this sounds a bit harsh and unrealistic, it is an ideal that we all can shoot for in one way or another. It is more a matter of attitude than of dollars and cents. The attitude of what is mine is mine, while perfectly logical and reasonable by today's standards, is downright irresponsible on an ideal level. Possessions and money are, in a sense, a gift. More accurately, they are a kind of loan. What we do with them is our business, quite literally. But that doesn't mean that we cannot be judged on our choices. This is the Torah's judgment of this attitude. It seems that our current situation has brought back a kind of Shemitah situation to our lives. Some have done just fine, while others have great needs. Regardless of the payback, it is times like these that demand of those who are blessed with a gift or loan of fortune to share some of that fortune with those who weren't. This may be difficult to do. It may seem unwise or even impossible, but to shirk such a responsibility would be nothing less than irresponsible. On the other hand, the reward of taking up some of that responsibility is a blessing that is nothing less than priceless. We are promised that we will feel we have done something of value with our lives. Shabbat Shalom.